All right, so uh, welcome and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Bloystein, and I am the moderator for Treatments for Cervical Radiculopathy. And uh, from Georgia, we have uh, an all-star cast. Uh, I recently uh, got out of the Army and uh, went into private practice, really private demia, those that don't know much about the Houston Clinic down in Columbus, Georgia, which uh, actually uh, spans across about four states. Uh, we're based out of Columbus, Georgia, and uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Doug Paul, uh, as well as Dr. Uh, Eric Westerland, uh, two of my partners. There are uh, six of us. It's an orthopedic practice. We are all orthopedic surgeons. Uh, super happy to uh, be moderating um, our uh, format tonight uh, will be a case-based uh, format. Uh, I feel like didactic um, and can be useful at times, but uh, in this case, I think uh, getting into uh, our minds and asking us questions, we'll be asking each other questions. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, for uh, any questions. We will interrupt each other to um, ask those questions if we are, um, haven't already, but ultimately we would rather you ask us all the questions and uh, we um, go through uh, all of these cases. Uh, disclosures, uh, so we uh, do have some uh, consulting uh, uh, disclosures uh, for all three of us. Ultimately, we have no conflicts of interest. Uh, we have not uh, developed any products related to uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion nor uh, disc replacement. Um, AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated uh, to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, we, uh, AO North America does not endorse nor promote the use of any product, service, or commercial entity. The equipment used in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes only with the intent to enhance the learning experience. Uh, here's some learning objecti objectives in uh, standard AO fashion. Um, we'd like to um, have you uh, outline the presentation of cervical radiculopathy, select a surgical intervention that treats isolated cervical radiculopathy, and describe surgical techniques in each procedure. <clears throat> this is our agenda tonight. Again, uh, we have uh, just cases. Uh, we do have some slides available if needed to do some didactics uh, and certainly can exit out and get to those if we need to. Uh, I suspect we won't. <clears throat> So to start, uh, and this will be interactive, like I said, so we're going to have some polling questions. Uh, I have a 34-year-old male, six-month history of radiating uh, right arm pain uh, into his uh, thumb uh, and middle finger, and um, some weakness, failed uh, course of non-operative management, activity modification, modification, NSAIDs, PT, gabapentin, and muscle relaxants, pain breakdown for uh, him is 80% right arm and 20% neck. His exam, uh, he's got decreased sensation to light touch over his right thumb, index, and middle fingers. The four out of five right bicep strength, uh, normal reflexes otherwise. Sperling sign uh, is positive uh, to the right, uh, and it causes some posterior arm pain. <clears throat> there are no upper motor neuron findings. So a quick polling question here uh, is a little anatomy and uh, presentation. What's your suspected lesion? Go ahead and uh, choose that for us. We got there. We got 10% uh, more than one level, uh, 66 are concentrating on C56. Um, okay. So a bit of a uh, spread, we'll see. Yep. Yeah. All right, so uh, here's some x-rays. So ultimately, uh, you know, reasonable lordosis on the lateral image there. Got some anterior osteophytes at the C56 and C67 level, as well as uh, some mild um, loss of uh, segmental lordosis there, but um, just a little anterior osteophytes, a little spondylosis uh, on the anterior projection, uh, a little bit of uncovertebral joint arthritis, but uh, not a ton. So here's some flexion extension x-rays. And uh, pretty good movement uh, there at uh, C56 and C67. I don't see any instability either. So at that point, uh, what, what is your next step in evaluation? CT, CT myelogram, MRI, nerve conduction studies, see if this is in your upper extremity versus radicular or straight to a 
while they're doing that, uh, uh, do, doing the answering, I'd like to add that you don't have any significant kyphosis segmentally at any of the levels of concern. Um, and the uh, and there's no instability that you pointed out, but those are two important things I look at when I'm considering an ACDF versus a TDA, which is a discussion at hand today. All right, so um, MRI 90%. I would agree with that. So here's your MRI as uh, requested. Appears that uh, mild desiccation at five, six, six, seven doesn't look too bad. Maybe a little bit of ligamentum flavum hypertrophy at uh, C6, seven, but five, six looks okay. Uh, it looks like uh, there's practically bilateral foraminal stenosis there at the five, six level. <clears throat> Here's six, seven, a little tighter on the right side there uh, than the left uh, with some stenosis. And we can uh, discuss this a little later. Obviously, that uh, you know the story is not told by one axial image. Uh, we should get a, a few through that to get a feel for it um, for purposes of presentation here. Uh, and so at this point, uh, some arm pain, uh, potentially two level, uh, certainly tight at two levels. Uh, what is your recommended uh, procedure? Uh, knowing what you know, C5, 6, C6, 7, ACDF, uh, go big uh, and go with a corpectomy. Um, posterior cervical laminoforaminotomies at both five, six, and six, seven on the right. Uh, cervical arthroplasty at both levels, or maybe a hybrid combination, ACDF and arthroplasty. It reminds me of taking the oity when there's no real wrong answer. Yeah. Okay, the preference looks like two level ACDF, the gold standard. Uh, I think that's very reasonable and a good choice. Okay. Got so, some other takers there too, though. It's kind of, I think you get, there's a good range of answers, but I'm kind of with you. That's interesting. So good. I mean, I, I think this, this is a great case, right? So this is the kind of stuff we really see and everybody else does every day. And these, um, they seem clear cut, but they're not you really do have to kind of think about them. Absolutely. So I think they're all, they're all options. And so, um, before we uh, proceed, I think it's very important to understand the differences between cervical radiculopathy and when you add myelopathy. Ultimately, cervical radiculopathy is typically a soft disc. It's foraminal only. Uh, on some patients, uh, it can be spondylotic radiculopathy, uh, but it, it seems to be uh, a younger patient's uh, disease process because they don't have as much arthritis. And uh, it truly is uh, ridiculous. Um, if you look at the patients that present with uh, radiculopathy, 90% um, of them have arm pain. Uh, you can have obviously the, the, the big three, the arm pain, sensory and motor uh, weakness. Uh, you can also have some reflex abnormalities. I think that's a little tougher uh, to tease out sometimes because uh, patients guard uh, during examination. These aren't slam dunks where, uh, oh, they've got a Hoffman, uh, we need to operate, and then the MRI comes back and it's normal. Uh, and so there, there can be other things that play a role uh, in trying to understand these things. Um, the indication for surgery in situations of cer cervical radiculopathy, so you got to have six to eight weeks of um, conservative management, really tincture of time. A lot of times these, uh, you know, get better with time. Medications have failed. Physical therapy has failed. Uh, physical therapy is a big piece uh, that uh, you have to consider uh, not only for your patients, but insurance. Uh, physical exam findings uh, localize the level of compression on MRI, right? You need that match, that classic uh, nerve root tension sign. And MRI is that same level and they have some arm pain. Uh, and those are all things that are um, important for radiculopathy, right? We're not talking about myelopathy. So, Case one, let's, uh, let's dig right in here. 40-year-old uh, uh, Georgia tree farmer, uh, manager, right? So he's not a laborer per se, he manages the laborers. He's right-hand dominant. And uh, he presents with uh, right shoulder pain and arm pain. Initially presented to one of my partners with some shoulder pain and uh, received a workup x-rays exam and his shoulder was normal, uh, he was referred. Uh, now has uh, more weakness than pain, uh, started about seven weeks ago. Uh, he continues to work and has had no formal physical therapy. 
his exam, he's got uh, some triceps weakness on the right side, his dominant side, four out of five, normal balance, normal clonus, negative Hoffman's bilaterally, uh, right triceps pain is constant uh, and it's not related to his head position, um, but it's, it's on, it's turned on, the switch is on. Uh, sensations normal uh, throughout the bilateral upper extremities and uh, the left upper extremity is normal. Any comments? If anybody, uh, if anybody has any questions, we're watching this Q&A box. Feel free feel to uh, throw those questions out while Dr. Gloystein's kind of going through these things. And we'll try to try to tag everybody's questions as we go. So uh, side question for you two. Uh, when you're examining a patient for uh, a cervical issue, do you do a full lower extremity exam on them? Uh, what, what's your take on that? Obviously, you're, you're looking at some balance because you're looking uh, to rule out myelopathy, but you know, what, what is your standard exam? So I'm gonna, I'll take the cheat answer. If it's, if it's pretty clear and straightforward on this case and going through the upper extremities, unless they provide some information in the scope of the history, or I find some other element in the scope of their exam to prompt me to kind of look otherwise, then usually I won't. I'll, th I'll turn, it, turn it around a little bit though. It's very, that's very different than in, in a case where there's somebody that comes in with a lumbar problem. Um, I'm pretty aggressive about looking for long track things so as not to miss something cervical, but I feel like it could be a little bit more cavalier in a setting where it's really dedicated cervical. Doug, what are your thoughts? You're muted. I'm exactly the same way. I'm not as aggressive with examining the lower extremities. Uh, the gait is a huge issue for me. Uh, I'll go back and redo a Hoffman's and an inverted radial reflex, and I'll check the, the uh, reflexes uh, very specifically. And then I'll have them walk again. Um, but I usually don't get, uh, maybe one out of 50, I'll do a, a lower extremity reflex examination with a, with a Babinski's. But Otherwise, I'm like uh, Dr. Westerlin, where it's the opposite. If they come in with any issue from a lumbar spine examination that I'm concerned about their neck, I will aggressively evaluate their neck. Great. So here's some x-rays. You guys want to, one of you want to comment on those? I'll, I'll, I'll take a go at it. Uh, so in terms of just global alignment, I think the alignment looks appropriate both coronally and sagittally. And that's, that's uh, gonna be important as we get downstream and start to think about some options, particularly that sagittal view. There's nice cervical curvature there. Um, definitely some disc changes, five, six and C6, seven, a little more pronounced at C5, six in terms of loss of disc space height with some osteophyte formation. No significant instability and nothing real else jumps out. And just from a big picture standpoint, those are adequate films. I really feel like I can see everything I need to see levels wise from just using straight up radiographs for starts. You guys routinely get uh, flexion extension x-rays? I do. I, I find them helpful, even if it's only for the sake of accentuating a particular level that's got a measure of instability. That, as an example, you could see the 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 disc change and the disc collapse before at that five, six level, sometimes that's not so clear. I might see it, you can almost convince yourself that maybe it's there and maybe it's not. And you look at those flexion extension views and it really becomes a lot more evident. And I think that does have some significant influence in the way you interpret MRI studies where you might not be able to, it might be even be a little further subtle, just seeing that degree of instability and interpreting the MRI with that in mind helps you understand sometimes a little more clearly uh, a patient and the pathology. I, uh, I see the same thing that, that um, Dr. Westlin does, the, the narrowing at the two discs. I like the alignment, the, uh, the lordosis. Um, this is a, essentially a, a two view, the, the mild asymmetry on the AP view or the PA view um, doesn't bother me when it's in the upper thoracic spine or even the mid thoracic spine. But I, I usually get, and it's pretty much in my um, initial patient evaluation for four views with flexion extension while standing, I, I've really gone away from uh, obliques unless it's for some sort of trauma. I was just going to ask. I was just going to ask. How, how about you, uh, Dr. Gloystein? What do you think? You, you like oblique films? or I, 
not super useful to me because uh, if I need to see some detail posteriorly, I get a CT scan. It's so easy. Uh, and so I agree with you. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a little spicule in the in the foramen if you get an oblique, but you're, you're lucky if you see that. Uh, and it's not really at the level that is bothering them anyway. So um, I agree. I, I don't have, see a lot of value in an oblique view. All right, let's... Uh, so I did get some flexion extension x-rays as well. Thoughts? You're, you're doing me a favor and making me and making my point. So yeah, I think, you know, it definitely becomes a little more clear at C5, C6. Um, I mean, you really appreciate it at both levels, but yeah, I think that accentuates it some, but otherwise it wouldn't add much to that. And, you know, these are good films, relatively mobile. All right, so here's where the meat and potatoes are. Uh, so he's got a C7 radic uh, presenting with uh, primarily, he's got that triceps pain, he's got some triceps weakness. And uh, interestingly, uh, any comments on the shoulder pain piece, right? So he presented with shoulder pain. Uh, you know, I think um, as uh, you guys are probably the same way, as um, longer in practice, you start appreciating more of the referred pain into the suprascapular nerve and the lateral medial pectoral nerves, uh, which kind of blows your mind. You sort of geek out a little bit when you start talking about those nerves, but ultimately that's uh, brachial plexus and it can absolutely cause some of those symptoms. So uh, I suspect, suspect maybe that uh, this was a um, potentially a referred pain from his um, pectoral. Uh, one of the pectoral nerves, uh, probably the lateral, since it's the C5, 6, and 7. Um, thoughts about that? How many uh, atypical presentations you see in your practice where they get chest pain or they get sort of scapular pain? Boy, I, I think it's actually more common than not. You, you have to sometimes have to ask to pick up on it, but yeah, it's, it's definitely there. It doesn't always help you entirely in terms of localizing a level, but I, th I think it's a lot more common than most people would report. I, I agree. I, I don't see that too much. Um, I, I will tell you the one atypical presentation that really confounds me exactly why it occurs is more of this anterior chest pain, the pectoralis region, even lower towards the nipple. Um, I just haven't really found a distinctive pathology for that subset of uh, the atypical uh, presentation, even though I look for it, I've had it probably 10 times in 10 years. And I know it's something cervical when they've had, they usually come in and they've had a complete cardiac workup, complete chest workup for other pathology, and it's all negative. And they're seeing you for their third, fourth, fifth opinion. And you kind of know based on radiographs that it's something to do with their neck that's just not quite right, but you just can't pick the level. But as far as scapular region of posterior, um, it's just really all over the place. You know, the facet, uh, syndrome mapping goes from the, you know, base of the skull down to the bra line and women is what I tell patients. So it, it does make it very difficult when they, when they present in that fashion, that's more of that atypical. We had a question in the Q and A about the utility of parasagittal views on MRI. And I think here, this is a good example. Yeah. I mean, they really are of, of use in sort of teasing this out and, it's like anything else. Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But you, you really try to use all of that imaging data, and parasagittals can be helpful. Yeah, I feel like um, it, they're a little more useful in the lumbar spine because uh, just you know the real estate is not as uh, much an issue down there as it is up here. So it's harder to see uh, good stuff at the foramen and the cervical spine. So my money is in the axials, but. Uh, when you're lucky like this, I mean, you can see that that's clearly, you, uh, you guys agree, that's a soft disc there uh, just by the color of it on the T2 weighted images. And then uh, you've got a, on the axial and um, the uh, sagittal shows that uh, large disc as well in the foramen. I won't, I won't get us too bogged down in the imaging, but I got asked this too. Every once in a while, I'll see a patient come in. I might throw this out to the participants just to field this as a bit of a question. But you see um people will come in with the uh, almost the oblique views on the oblique reconstructions on the MRI. You don't see that very often, but they're pretty neat images. You really do kind of see a lot. Does anybody get those routinely? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting when they show up, you do seem to see them nicely, but 
Very good. All right, I'm going to go through a couple more MRIs. Don't yeah, want to bog nice. down too much here. Yeah. The uh, th this is the six seven level uh, as we walk in a little bit, uh, but I do want to show um, the five six level, and there's a little nudge there to the cord on the left side, as you can see, uh, and um, I think that. Uh, you know, it's going to obviously play into things here, uh, but ultimately the bottom line is this patient has only right-sided C7 symptoms, radicular symptoms. So at this point, what would the uh, participants do uh, for this patient? It's two-level ACDF, hybrid disc replacement uh, at 6.7 and an ACDF at 5.6. And the reason that option is there is because uh, if someone wants to push the disc replacement, um, five six obviously has those anterior osteophytes and didn't move a whole lot in flexion extension views. Um, you got a two level disc replacement at both levels, uh, foraminotomies, or you this guy didn't have any physical therapy. We sent him to physical therapy. Weakness and pain. And while they're filling that out, um, is it weakness alone a reason to rush to surgery, fellas? Is, it, is that uh, something that you uh, would skip the typical six to eight weeks of uh, non-operative management? Does that push your timeline a little bit? Uh, no, I'm going to answer it two ways. It's a bit of a hedge. My answer is no. However, if you've got somebody and you're watching them closely and they're, pro they're progressively getting weaker and weaker, even on short order, I sort of approach that a bit differently. But, but in and of itself, face value, I think, Weakness alone would not prevent me from at least making a reasonable go at non-operative treatment to include structured physical therapy. And there was a question that, that we got already about, uh, you know, what do you, patients will ask, what's physical therapy going to do for me? Um, that sometimes it is a hard question to answer. What do you, what do you guys tell your patients when they say, hey, therapy, what's that going to do? My arm's not working and I'm dying here. What, what's this going to do for me? Uh, I actually answered that one to one of the uh, attendees or participants. Um, mm -hmm. My answer to, to this person was, it, you really have to educate and train the patient in the reason that they hurt. Um, it's more of the spondylotic arrangement, the, the abnormality, the disc, the disc degeneration, the collapse, the instability, even if it's a micro instability that's causing some of that micro motion to both the uh, disc as well as the irritation of the nerve roots. And once they're once they get that, I find that most of them, and not always in the South where we live, most of them will uh, gather the idea that okay, if it's unstable, then stabilizing with the muscles around the neck should be able to help some of the symptoms. And then my caveat answer was, um, I tell them, hey, don't go six weeks if you're not feeling any relief in the first couple of visits. Then cease and desist. Come back and see me, and we'll move on to the next step. So it looks like uh, the 44% uh, want to do a two-level ACDF on him, which I think is a great option. Uh, let's see. The least favorite was the hybrid disc, it looks like, uh, with ACDF. All right. So uh, caveat, uh, insurance uh, disapproved your surgery so and said you must do six weeks of formal physical therapy. So uh he went to physical therapy and actually uh felt like uh he got a little better but continues to have significant weakness at this point and uh has done a bunch of research and says i want a disc replacement i'm a young guy and uh give give me the disc replacement and why do you so so ultimately i offered this gentleman an acdf two level which is what uh, most of the participants chose because uh, I believe it's a gold standard. I feel like um, he had a little bit of collapse at five, six, and it's a, just a great surgery. And um, he said, well, doc, why do you want to do five, six? I don't have any left-sided symptoms. I said, yeah, I can't argue with that. And uh, your thoughts, guys, on uh, how you handle a patient like this, because uh, uh, I think it's important to understand the uh, patient factors. To me, this is super real, right? This is it. So you and uh, and I'll even roll it back one further to the person that comes in after therapy, and you say, "Hey, look, you know, you're kind of heading the wrong direction. You're definitely not getting where you need to be. If anything, you're kind of worsening." I'm, I'm going to go over some surgical options. They say, "Hey, hey, whoa, whoa, is there anything else I might try? What about you know? I've heard I had a friend of mine that got some injections and got better. How about a roll for cervical injections?" I, 
I use them often. We had one que a question, participant question about that, and I'm comfortable with uh, cervical epidural steroid injections in a patient with radiculopathy. Um, what do you guys think? Is yes, no, maybe place for it? So I think there's definitely a place for it. Uh, it's not predominant in my practice, I would tell you. I, I just feel like it's a, a real estate issue. Uh, and so unless a patient really wants to uh, pursue that as an option, I will definitely do it um, because I always try to tell them, you know, tincture of time. Sometimes that's all you need. It'll get better over time. But if this is, you know, over eight weeks, uh, they're looking for a non-surgical option, I, I definitely think uh, that it, it is one. Uh, most of my injections and refer referrals are those tough levels that you're trying to tease out. Is it a true, you know, they've got a little bit of shoulder pathology. You've got a little C3-4 um, issue. They've got some shoulder pain. It's in the trap. And I'm trying to figure out, is it coming from the neck or how much is it coming from the neck? And I do a selective nerve root block. Um, but the, you know, the, um, the steroid injection, the is not much different than a selective nerve root block. And so that, that's typically what I'll use. Yeah. The, if I get a patient that's probably the, the setting where I'm going to you know, be most fervent or encouraging about cervical epidural steroid injection is that patient that's improving, but it's just kind of creeping along. We're like, yeah, they're better, but they're not great. Maybe we kind of give it a little nudge or something like that. So I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing it. And I kind of bring it up as an option, but I kind of lean on somebody a little bit heavier if they're actually making some improvement to kind of really feel like they've exhausted everything. I mean, this is a great case because in terms of options, there's a bunch of different options here and they're reasonable. So this is one where really are stuck spending. If, if this was every patient that showed up, that would be great and torture at the same time, because you're really spending a bunch of time with this patient, getting them invested that yeah, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. And my, my, my bias, if they said, do whatever you want to do to, in my hands, this is a two level ACDF. If I had, could, could just kind of go for it and do it, but I'd be the first to admit, Hey, you, there's a disc here above. You may come to needing something in the future, but if we're really going to focus on just the one that's most symptomatic for you now, this is a one level procedure and there's still a range of options. Absolutely. Doug, any comments? No, I, I'm, I agree with you two uh, on those points. Uh, sorry on that one. I was listening peripherally while I was at answering a different question um, that was brought up, and I'll bring it up right now. Um, a couple of people have asked these questions about timing, and this one specifically from one of the participants. If the patient in case one was a chief soloist in the church choir who is anticipating a solo in the Christmas, Christmas pageant, would it change the surgical man approach after uh, failing conservative management? Um, obviously, this is a relation to uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve um, concerns. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, it might not change my approach, but it would definitely change my counseling. Um, so I guess I'm sort of cheating there because it ultimately may change my approach. If the patient says, oh, no, no, I don't want anything to do with any risk from something from an anterior approach, you might consider something otherwise. But a lot of that is, is I think, built into the counseling part of things just by understanding the patient well. That's what I said. That's what I answered. Same thing. Okay, so I'm a, I got another question for you. Um, I probably, based on uh, my patients, my hands, my complications, I've had, because uh, we all know, I've had three recurrent laryngeal nerve neuropraxias, and I thank God I call them neuropraxias because they've all returned. <laughs> uh, and so I would say, let's do the surgery after your solo, just in case you get a neuropraxia. Uh, because they've all resolved within three months. That's why this anterior cervical approach is so, so just, just such a great surgery uh, and patients love it. Um, you know, most of them Horners, I've, I've seen one, I've had one. Uh, it's uh, three months and it resolves. Um, most of everything that uh, happens after these uh, resolve. Uh, and so- do you, do you approach these from the left side or the right side or what do you do? Great question. Uh, you know, like most orthopedic surgeons, I don't know about you guys, but when I see a patient, they've already had surgery and have an incision on the right, I say, oh, who is your neurosurgeon? Uh, because they're not afraid to go to the right side. Uh, I've just was taught left side and I'm just used to it, even though I'm right-handed. Uh, it just feels more natural to me. I have gone from the right side and a patient who's had a previous uh, surgery and, and uh, I needed to, uh, as well as a gunshot wound to the neck, I had to go, they had it on the left. So I went on the right side. 
Um, so uh, I'm a left-sided approach guy. How about you guys? But I, I bias to the left only based upon that sense that the course of the recurrent laryngeal is a little more predictable so that at least there's some body of literature to show that you're less likely to get a neuropraxia. But I'll be the first to admit that's not bomb-proof um, literature and it's old, but it makes me feel warm and fuzzy, you know, staying on the left because of that. I will, um, I'll choose the side opposite of prior uh, surgery if it's near the same level, the scar is near the same level, or if they have an oblique scar. Um, but if I can, I prefer left sided, even if I'm uh, a level or two above, if I know the incision is going to be quite a bit above the old one, I'll still go through the, the um, ipsilateral side and I prefer the left. Um, I, I really, there, there's a lot of oity questions, a lot of board questions about the recurrent laryngeal nerve. I, in my 12 years, I've seen it four times, twice with my surgery, one resolved in a couple of months, the other one took about six months. Everything else was determined to be GERD which is quite often um, an issue after the surgery. And the two others that I had were from other surgeons that were formal um, paresis of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And they were miserable patients. Unfortunately, they were not my surgeries. Now I've been dealing with them since, but it's a, that's a tough, that's a tough uh, complication when you get it, but that, it's still very, very rare. Absolutely. All right, so I did what the patient asked me to do. I ultimately put in a C67 uh, total disc replacement and uh, left five, six alone. And I was just like uh, Dr. Westerlin, I, uh, I wanted to do a two level ACDF on this gentleman. Uh, doing great, happy as a clam. And uh, he's, uh, I can't get him to come back. Uh, I did his surgery in uh, February and he, that's, it's usually a good sign when they won't come back because they're too busy and they're doing well, uh, ultimately. Um, some may ask there, you know, you have that little coronal tilt. Um, I've done a lot of uh, cervical disc replacements, keeled and non-keeled. And, uh, you know, you sort of, um, relegated to what the end plate looks like. And if there's a little bit of spondylosis, uh, it's gonna be a little tilted uh, because uh, I typically do not use a burr uh, as much as I can, uh, even in the back. I'll try to just use a, a kerosene uh, to take down the, the posterior aspect. Uh, I also uh, release the PLL on all uh, patients that I do a discectomy on, whether it's an ACDF or not. And, um, and so uh, I've never had a problem with that coronal uh, tilt uh, on patients. Uh, fellas, any comments? No, I think it looks great. I think your end plate coverage looks, looks great. great. Positioning looks great. Yeah, and the patient's doing clinically well. So all of that clicks and this was a great option. And I think this is a really good case because gave the patient a bunch of options, kind of gave your bias. They told them what, and, and they really, you gave them enough room for them to be able to direct you for what was best for them. You know, recognizing that including some consideration for that level above was reasonable because there was enough degenerative change there that if you address it now, you don't have to come back. But if they're comfortable knowing that there's some change there, they might need something in the future and they really just want to focus on the area of symptoms that that's, entirely reasonable. I think if you put this up in from a room full of surgeons, you get that same distribution, but ultimately if you can really get the patients informed and in a strong position to understand the pros and cons like you did, they're going to tell you what's best for them. And this, this guy's doing great. It sounds like. Yeah. All right, let's move on. All right. Case two. This is a retired Air Force gentleman who now works at Home Depot and has 50% neck pain, 50% uh, right arm pain. Uh, and uh, five years ago, interestingly, while he was on uh, drill sergeant duty, uh, was um, having some right arm pain, uh, mostly into his biceps, and uh, had a foraminotomy. He uh, read some stuff on the internet and decided he did not want an anterior cervical discectomy infusion and uh, wanted something from the back, which is pretty rare. I don't think I've ever had a patient request a posterior procedure. Uh, had a foraminotomy and his uh, 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 symptoms went away. 
And now um, he represents with uh, pain in his arm and some weakness and hasn't been able to work at Home Depot. So exam, he's got normal strength, uh, bilateral uppers. He's got some hyperreflexia, but uh, this is the situation where I'll bounce down and examine the lower extremities when I feel a little bit of hyperreflexia or a Hoffman, uh, just to see if there's a difference. Uh, I tell you, uh, in my practice uh, and over the years, uh, it's pretty common to have folks that have uh, hyperreflexia, both uppers and lowers, symmetric top to bottom, side to side. Um, he's got a positive spurlings to the to the right when he uh, extends and laterally bends. Um, it has some pain into his uh, um, six and seven, mostly triceps pain. And then he's got some decreased sensation over the six and seven dermatomes of the hand, which is thumb, index, and middle fingers. So here is x-rays. Is, uh, as I said, his previous foraminotomy was at uh, C56. And if you look real close there, I'm gonna zoom in on it. Um, that right side, um, he's got a significant amount of uh, uncle vertebral joint arthritis you can appreciate. Here's his MRI, C56. <clears throat> he's got uh, primarily right-sided foraminal stenosis. Not horrible, I'd call it moderate. Sort of walking down, you can, you know, I was mentioning how uh, you can, usually there are uh, two slices uh, between the two pedicles when you're coming down the axials uh, to see, and he's pretty tight on both at the six, seven level, which uh, sort of matches that he has sort of a dominant triceps pain on that side. So polling questions, what'd you guys do for him? Two level ACDF, hybrid, disc replacement, foraminotomies. Would you revision for anatomy on that right side? I suspect I know the answer. All right, so about 80% uh, two level ACDF. Some would uh, do a for anatomy, maybe that uh, C67 at least. Um, okay. And then there's uh, some takers on the hybrid. All right, so I chose uh, ACDF uh, for this gentleman and uh, he's three months out now uh, doing well and has resolution of his uh, arm symptoms. Uh, gosh, I, what can you say about the, the gold standard fellows? I mean, uh, I love this surgery. Um, the, the ability to um, apply some distraction and get that implant in there I think is key. Uh, you know, the 10% per level of motion loss, especially at two levels. Do you guys tell them they, you know, that all patients will ask you, what, what, how much motion am I going to lose? What can I, can I, and can't I do? What kind of answer do you give there, Dr. Paul? Um, after how many months? Six months? Uh, just sort of what, what your approach is when patients uh, at pre op. Uh, ask, well, you're going to fuse my cervical spine at, at two levels. Uh, what should I expect? What, what can I do? What can I do? I, my standard um, from where I trained was uh, for the first six weeks, uh, soft collar, most of the time, take it off for hygiene and eating, um, lift less than 10 pounds, which is probably a little bit of overkill. And then the second six weeks, um, no collar, you lift up to 25 pounds. And this part of the country uh, and world, people are asking about golf. I say you can chip and putt at three months, um, especially if your radiographs look like this and you're doing well with no complaints and then uh, increase to your um, short iron or long irons and then the short irons over the next few months. Uh, ultimately, I follow them for a year to make sure they're fused, although your radiographs look fantastic. If they fuse a little earlier than I say, unrestricted activity, typically it's six months anyway. Um, and they do ask about the stiffness. So I tell them uh, something that's probably not in the vernacular of most spine surgeons. And I say, well, I wish you stayed stiff. I really, really want you to stay stiff and you wouldn't be harmed by it. You might find yourself having some difficulty putting a light bulb in or looking up at an airplane if you want to look up at the sky or something. But unfortunately, you're not going to remain as stiff as I want you to remain. And that is going to cause a problem with adjacent levels at a later date as the pressure and 
uh, spondylosis engages the other discs. Um, so unfortunately, you won't remain stiff. You'll you'll get your uh, stiffness resolved, but then you and I are going to be talking about another level of, at a later date. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a interesting approach, and uh, it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, those uh, additional levels uh, break down. I think Hillebrand said three percent per year uh, adjacent to a fusion. And, um, you know, you're going to you know, ask him, uh, you know, you want him to be as active as possible, but, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for. And that's the conversation I have as well. Eric, any comments? Uh, no, you know me, I'm a Jefferson guy. So I got brainwashed by, by Alan Hillebrand. So I kind of tell him the same pitch. I actually tell him acutely, you're going to move better. I mean, that's part of the reason to do it functionally. You're actually going to move better than you're doing right now. And that for a two level functionally, you're probably not gonna appreciate any meaningful limits with your range of motion. And I might sort of discuss that a bit differently with a high performance athlete or an army ranger or somebody that's kind of really getting after it. But my protocol as to return to activity is, is reasonably similar to, to Dr. Paul's. It's about as close, just you know, tiny little changes. I, between four and six months, I'll let them do anything. They want to pull the ejector seat on an F-16 and they've managed to sneak this back onto the aircraft. I'm going to let them have at it at that point. <laughs> you need a waiver for that. Well, sometimes I just don't tell. That's that's a different story. <laughs> Very true. So uh, collar, how long are you using a collar? Is it soft or hard? Yeah, soft collar. It's a strategic device. It's a reminder for the patient and it's a billboard for the rest of the world. And I kind of put it on them to behave and tell them the real important stuff's on the inside, but largely by instructions to the patient. Otherwise, they're very similar to what Dr. Paul has shared. Yeah, my training was six weeks hard collar, and um, I'm soft collar as well now. Uh, yeah, so my tra training was three months in a Aspen, kind of, and so that I, I absolutely, uh, I don't, I could say evolved, but then that's my ego showing through. I've definitely changed, put it that way. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, last case here where I think we're on time, we're doing well, um, and we can linger if we need to. Uh, so 45 year old uh, male, this is actually a case that I help uh, partner with uh, over Fort Gordon, Dr. Jackson. Uh, a very cool case here, uh, don't see these very often. So 45 year old uh, gentleman, active duty, uh, presents with uh, severe left hand pain, intrinsic weakness and hand dysfunction. Um, is no right upper extremity symptoms, no balance issues, uh, but he's got some left grip strength and uh, hand abductors that are four out of five, C8 sensory loss or ulnar nerve for that matter, right? When you examine them, uh, Hoffman's and uh, negative as well as inverted uh, radio reflex. Um, and uh, let's see here, here's his x-rays. I don't know that there's anything significant uh, at this level, although, uh, fellas, what do you what do you think? In what level uh, is being affected? Could you could you back up one slide? What was the the history one more time? Oh yeah, sure. Oop, wrong way. Oops, sorry, I sabotaged you. Forty five, <laughs> severe left hand. Okay. Left hand. In the intrinsic weeks. weakness is the giveaway. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's a yeah. classic uh, answer, STEM comment for an oity question or board question. Um, so um, it's down, well, is it, you have a polling question on this one before I answer it? Uh, we've got one, uh, only one polling for this and that's uh, treatment. Uh, so we're not- <laughs> Well, there's so, your answer right there. Uh, <laughs> So my point is, so, so C8 symptoms, we're talking about radiculopathy. So we're looking at C7, T1 level. And uh, if you look at the lateral, right? First thing you're thinking of is, okay, can I get to this? And that looks like it's pretty deep. 7-1 looks like it's below the clavicle there. Yeah, you're gonna, you, you may be working. Yeah, so um, that- Would you, I mean, I think, I think MRIs, I think MRI is helpful there too. Sometimes on the MRI, if they were kind enough to give you enough field to actually see the manubrium, you can really tell, but you don't always have it unless you've asked for it. Yeah, this is what you get. You get the black line yeah. down yeah. uh, through the tongue, right? 
Right, so uh, seven one level there, you can really see it here. So that left image is the C six seven bilateral foramina, and then the right image there is uh, the C seven T one. So you see that big juicy disc uh, mashing on that uh, nerve root, uh, the C eight nerve root there at C seven T one on the left, uh, and so. That's because I, I got to tell you guys, uh, I, I really don't see a lot of pathology at the C7 T1 level in someone who has not had any uh, cervical spine surgery before. Uh, thoughts or comments on that? Uh, it seems it does seem less common. I, I don't know the I don't know the data, but it definitely seems less common. Yeah, I agree. Less this this is this is a very interesting disc herniation. It, um, it makes you wonder if there's something uh, more spondylotic about the typical motion segments in the subaxial spine than what you see at this level. This is just a really strange one to get a disc herniation at 7-1, like an altered uh, mechanism of injury that's not the typical. Do, do you remember, uh, Dr. Gloystein, exactly how this uh, happened? I don't. Uh, I, I think he just, uh, it was sort of insidious. He noticed his hand wasn't working as well over time. He didn't wake up and have a ton of neck pain. It was really a presentation of, of hand dysfunction over time. Well, I, I tend to bias towards the anterior surgery. I'm very comfortable both anterior and posterior, but this I don't want to bias the audience, but this might be the one that sort of makes me think I, I'd, uh, I'd be looking at foraminotomy options, but I know there's another, a couple of different ways to do this, so we'll see. Yeah, because that's the conundrum, especially if you've got a low C7 T1, you got a high clavicle, however you want to slice that. And big chest. Big, right. Barrel chest, big chest, what have you. It's tough, uh, as you guys know. So, And then uh, the other point that uh, everyone's probably waiting for someone to say is almost every patient comes in and they have ulnar nerve symptoms, right? Bilateral. Uh, you know, I've got this numbness tingling in my small finger. Uh, gosh, I see it at every clinic where somebody comes in. Obviously, when it's bilateral, you're, you're thinking that, uh, it, you know, it's something other than uh, some kind of disc herniation or radiculopathy. So um, I just sort of um, very surprised if I ever see something at C71 because usually it's an ulnar nerve issue at the, at the elbow. All right, let's see what else we got here. All right, so here's your polling question. What procedure would you offer this, uh, gentlemen? So would you do a super sexy transclavicular, transmanubrial approach because uh, you know how good the gold standard is, the ACDF, and uh, we just, you just got to get there at the cervicothoracic junction, uh, or do you do a foraminotomy discectomy? Or do you do a facetectomy in the back, laminectomy, and just do a fusion, put some screws in? I'll ask a, a generalized question while people are kind of thinking about answers for this. And this came up in the Q&A about uh, ACDF as an option in general and graft choice. Um, bank bone, patient's bone, titanium, peak. The question really was about titanium versus peak. But what do you, do you guys have any thoughts or biases on that? Yeah, so uh, I'm a titanium, all titanium. It can be 3D printed or um, cut, whatever, you, you know, CNC uh, or a, uh, titanium with uh, titanium sprayed peak. I don't use peak only implants anymore. I just, the hydrophobic piece uh, really uh, turns me off. And uh, so I, I do, I'm probably 50, 50 metal, all metal versus uh, some kind of spray metal on uh, peak. And I've had good results. As for the biologic question, uh, my uh, mentors uh, were always uh, crest graft. And I have used crest graft uh, for my past uh, nine years, uh, roughly at Fort Gordon. Uh, I did a little here and there, but, you know, John Devine was my mentor and, uh, you know, you, you, you got to use Crest Graft and had great results with it. And I found out through the grapevine, he wasn't using Crest Graft anymore. I was like, what, what's going on? What's happening? The wheels are coming off. I don't know if he's on the call or on the webinar, but, uh, and so I, I have, uh, started using, um, 
the, the glass options, uh, bioactive glass synthetics. And that, that ACDF I did is a bioactive glass and I've uh, been very happy with the results. Now, maybe it's cheating because it looks so good on x-ray right away, uh, but uh, I've had uh, no problems with it at this point. Anything Number you want to add to that, Dr. Paul? Um, uh, I, I did answer that question. I was decidedly ambiguous. I believe oh, in the one of the, uh, but <laughs> the I'll, recuse my, I'll recuse myself because of the, my disclosure on that one. I'm sorry. No, nah, so so I mean, I, and I'll I'll kind of give you my two cents too. I'll ask myself so that I'm I'm one of those that I don't really care if you're using titanium or peak or unicorn horn or whatever you want to use, as long as it's sort of got good sensible biologic capacity to it. I think using smooth peak doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and so I'll, that I'll commit to, but I think you can defend just about any other variation on the theme, as long as it's going to be some surface or material or structural design that's going to participate in that index biologic response. And to some degree, I kind of feel the same way about graft. I mean, I think you have to be sensible about, sensible about it and, and do your best to kind of um, to, to know the literature and, and otherwise, but there are a lot of good options out there. And we've just gotten to be very good at ACDF with the materials that we have available now, but using a graft material, uh, a structural material that's participating in the index response in some way so that you're getting in-growth or on-growth or through-growth, I think that's important. Yeah, I totally agree. Because the, the meat and potatoes is the discectomy and the in-plate prep and preparing it for that index uh, uh, response. So uh, yeah, because if you're doing good carpentry, uh, I think that's the key. There's a question from the, uh, the audience about uh, any prospective studies that you two might know of comparing posterior foramenal decompression and discectomy with anterior approaches? I, I do not, um, but uh, do, you, do either of you know one coming up? Prospective. There's a lot of studies, but if, I don't know that I could name a prospective one. I don't know of a prospective one either. They, they look retrospectively. And uh, ultimately, there's a reoperation rate, you know, the, the posterior foraminotomies, they, they like them because there's no implants. Um, you, can, you can do them outpatient. Uh, it's a small incision. Most do it through a tube. Uh, I certainly do. And, um, but, but, you know, don't do them a whole lot, ultimately, because the ACDF is such a great surgery. Uh, although I think it's training bias, right? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And in general, uh, this is this is a general um, uh, comment, but it's probably true. Um, most orthopedic uh, uh, fellowships uh, don't teach uh, or see a lot of foraminotomies. So you guys have any thoughts? Did you guys do a lot? I did zero in my uh, fellowship. Um, now I know Eric uh, has uh, done, he had uh, foraminotomy Fridays, right? Yeah, I did a lot. I was, I was spoiled, but I, I think that it was enough to learn that it's one of those very, very artful procedures where uh, you get these people that have just done hundreds or thousands and thousands. And it's very, I mean, I guess this is true of anything, but this in particular, it's, it's a very artful procedure, right? And I think it's one of those, you have to do a lot of them to really have that gift to make it work. And so, yeah, I'm comfortable with it. I was fortunate enough to kind of do a lot, but I still bias towards ACDF for all the reasons I think we've been talking about. Yeah, and my partner- That's a good transition to this question though, right? So, exactly, So, because my partner that I did that case with, he taught me, uh, he let me help him with it, but really I, you know, I was sort of watching him and, he did a fantastic job and he, cause I was always, you know, you think keyhole for anatomy and you do a circle when you know, in, actual, in actuality, it's um, better to do a square for anatomy because uh, a lot of times if you do the circle, it will leave a sliver of bone in the foramen that uh, you don't realize is there. And if you, if you think about the square and the anatomy there, uh, it's more effective. And so, yeah, I just, that's why I, I sort of wish that all uh, fellowships had uh, some time with orthopedic, at least had some time with uh, neurosurgeons that could teach you how to do those when you're in an institution that doesn't have orthopedic surgeons that do uh, a lot of foraminotomies because I think it's a very valuable procedure. 
uh, that um, uh, does well uh, ultimately in selected patients. And in this case, it uh, looks like 65% have chosen to do a posterior foraminotomy and discectomy because you can do a discectomy. And that's exactly what we did. <clears throat> and uh, the benefit is that um, he had significant uh, improvement, although his grip strength didn't get all the way back to five out of five at last follow up. Uh, he's happy and remains on active duty, which means his hands uh, working better. And that is actually a uh, post-op uh, uh, MRI uh, to assess whether that um, disc was uh, removed. And we got a pretty decent sized disc in there, but that's, you're doing a discectomy, man. That was the first time I had done one uh, posteriorly. It's, it's scary. Uh, if you haven't How about his course, what, did, what, did, what did you do with him post-op? Active duty guy, what, what was a... Uh... Do you, do you remember what he, he was doing in the military and would you let him get back to you and just sort of rough time course? It seems like you'd be able to accelerate his time back to full participation, but I'm curious to know how you, how you sort of timed that out. Well, uh, I, I don't remember because I wasn't, uh, you know, I was just helping sure. him with yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Jackson ultimately, but I suspect uh, cause you know, it's the military and depending on your MOS and I don't remember what his MOS was, um, sure. maybe if, uh, Dr. Jackson's on the webinar, he can chime in in the Q and A. <laughs> I didn't mean uh, to put you on the spot. I just was curious because I didn't know. know the answer. But ultimately, uh, you have to, uh, see what his rank is and how much control he has over his life, he or she, right in the military. And, and Dr. Paul, I know you, you were in the, uh, army as well and, and, uh, understand these things where, um, that, that drives most of it because you can have some really unreasonable, um, chains of command that don't, uh, they want you to get right back to it. Obviously he has a uh, weakness in that left side and, and I'd want to really sit on him for about 90 days, at least before I start him back on, uh, getting, uh, significantly involved in all the, um, training in the morning and PT and all that stuff. So, um, but ultimately if he had to go to war, right. Uh, the company commander makes that decision, not you. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Gleistin, it's a question from one of the participants. Uh, when you did that particular case with your partner, uh, was it a sitting or a prone uh, position? It's prone. Prone. We did uh, tongs. I'm a tongs guy. I, uh, I don't think I've ever done a posterior or cervical without tongs. Um, and uh, that's what I was taught. Uh, and so um, that's what I've always done. So we put them in tongs. Uh, but the beauty is you don't have to put them in the bracing position that you are typically putting patients in for a posterior cervical laminectomy and infusion with lateral mass screws and uh, maybe C7, T1 pedicle screws, uh, which is that tuck your chin and then push it back. You know, I went to West Point, so uh, I always show when I um, uh, talk about posterior cervicals and the K-line that you got to get them in that position so that it will drape away and... Uh, in this case, you can actually flex the neck and open the shingling of the lamina to really get you in there and uh, be able to see that, especially when you're going to do a discectomy. That's what my partner taught me. Any other questions? Uh, it looks like we're right on time. We've got through uh, three cases, although uh, that very first case we went through we can do a quick case resolution here. Uh, just as a reminder, we had uh, C5-6 there was tight, uh, more right on the left uh, than the left. Uh, C6-7 was pretty tight as well. And the recommended treatment, I think, that uh, everyone wanted to do was that C5-6. Let's, well, let's see if uh, anyone would change. Yeah, if we did it, if we did this right, then the uh, then everybody should be confused. There's going to be a lot of new answers. Right? Yeah. No. Today. Exactly. <laughs> One hundred percent correct, Doctor Westland. Yes. Let's see what they want to do with this guy again. I know it's hard to remember quick, but it looks like most ACDF there. Yeah. And uh, a couple uh, twenty percent will be uh, two level uh, cervical arthroplasty. And I did a two-level arthroplasty on this gentleman. Looks good. Yeah. Looks super good. So here's some take-home messages. Cervical radiculopathy has many options for cervical intervention. 
I think it's important to identify those contraindications. And we didn't really dive into disc replacement a ton. Uh, you know, I've done a decent amount of them. I would tell you that I love the procedure. I think it's great. Uh, maintains motion. Uh, it's ready to go day of surgery. <clears throat> uh, you're just waiting for the incision to heal. Uh, but ultimately, it's a young person surgery, right? You can't have any spondylosis. So I'm extremely picky about uh, when I do those. And um, uh, if there's any inkling of uh, spondylosis, I typically don't do it. And I think that's very important to understand for when to do it, when to not, you know, not every... Um, uh, every patient needs that that one surgery. Um, isolated radiculopathy is reserved for those patients that have nerve root mediated symptoms. Uh, important to distinguish from uh, the myelopathy. Uh, and then, uh, you know, surgical tips and tricks. I think those are important to put in your tool bag uh, as we discuss. And ho hopefully, uh, you guys learned something uh, for the approach, the presentation, uh, and surgical techniques. And here's a little summary there for our live event, uh, multiple options there. So uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you to my uh, partners and uh, uh, co-moderators. Uh, appreciate it. Hope everyone learned something. And please let us know if you prefer this uh, type of presentation versus didactic. Certainly we have tons of slides we can show. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, what is uh, most valuable to most is to hear Spine surgeons talk about uh, what they do in their own practice. Mm -hmm.